Welcome to the second session of this Balfour Project Conference, Abandoning Palestine, the End of the Mandate and Our Continuing Responsibility. My name is Phyllis Starkey and I was formerly a Member of Parliament from 1997 to 2010 and I'm chairing this session today. Yesterday's proceedings have been recorded and uploaded overnight to the Balfour Project website at www.balfourproject.org. That session looked at what Britain did wrong in its role in the events before, during and at the close of the mandate. It detailed Britain's duplicity, partiality and failure to protect or even take note of the rights of the Palestinians, which led to the current situation in Israel-Palestine today. We heard from Dr. Hanan Ashrawi in Palestine and Dr. Garda Kami, who lived through the Nakba as a child, about the changing role of the mandate police from Lord Cope and the history of Britain's betrayal of its mandate duty to prepare the Palestinians for self-government from Professor Avi Schlein. Roger Hardy presented contemporaneous photographs from Israeli archives demonstrating the reality of the Nakba and John McHugo set out the legal void left by the departing British, a void that sets the scene for the first contribution in today's session from Professor Michael Link. The session today looks forward and focuses on what the UK can do now to redress the effects of its past actions and to actively push for equal rights for Palestinians, not just wait for a political solution to materialize. Our first two speakers are unable to be with us directly due to other commitments, but Professor Michael Link's presentation on the strange afterlife of the British Defence Emergency Regulations would be read by John McHugo. And Rory Stewart, former MP and Minister, has recorded his presentation on Britain in a post-imperial world. There will then be a short five minute break before we move to two panel discussions. First, Imad Karam, one of our trustees, will chair a panel of Palestinians to discuss their experiences as Palestinians living in Britain and their ideas on what Britain needs to do now to right past wrongs and to act to achieve equal rights for Palestinians. Leila Moran MP, Liberal Democrat and the first MP of Palestinian heritage will then talk about her family history before joining the other members of the parliamentary panel, David Jones, Conservative, Julie Elliott, Labour, and Tommy Shepherd, Scottish Nationalist Party. At that point, there will be a Q&A with the MPs and you should post your questions in the chat. Today's session is also being recorded and will be downloaded overnight onto the Balfour Project website. So to begin our session today, let me first introduce Victor Catan, a senior research fellow from the School of Law at Nottingham University, formerly of the Middle East Centre at the University of Singapore, a respected scholar of international law, currently studying the prohibition of apartheid outside South Africa in international law. He will introduce the contribution of Professor Michael Link. Victor. Thank you, Phyllis, and good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Michael Link, who just completed a six-year term as United Nations Special Rapporteur for the Human Rights Situation in the Palestinian Territory occupied since 1967. Unfortunately, as Phyllis just mentioned, Professor Link cannot join us in person today. So his paper will be read by John McHugo, who is a trustee of the Balfour Project and a well-known author of several critically acclaimed books on the history of the Middle East. Before I hand over to John, I want to say a few words about the paper regarding the British Defence Emergency Regulations of 1945 that were promulgated at the height of the Jewish Revolt. What Professor Link does particularly well in his paper is to draw parallels between Israel's counterterrorism law of 2016 and these earlier emergency regulations from the British Mandate period. It also occurred to me while 
reading his paper that there might be parallels between Israel's counterterrorism laws and the internal security laws promulgated by the South African parliament during the apartheid era. Intriguingly, back in 1987, Al-Haq, which is a leading Palestinian human rights group, which was designated a terrorist organization under Israel's counterterrorism law in October last year, inquired with the British Minister of State for the Middle East about the validity of the British Defense Emergency Regulations of 1945. The British government responded by explaining that although Britain considered the regulations repealed as a matter of English law, it could not comment on their status under the laws of any other country. Of course, Israel is not the only former, formerly British ruled territory that has kept controversial colonial laws on its statute books. I recall from my days in Southeast Asia that the Sedition Act was still being used quite liberally in Singapore and Malaysia. But without much further ado, I hand the floor to John to read Professor Link's paper. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, please remember I am speaking as Michael Link, and so these are his words, not mine. And when I, when I say I or me, that is referring to Michael and not to myself. Thank you to the Balfour Project for this generous invitation to be part of this virtual conference. I have long followed the extraordinary work of the Balfour Project as it educates the public in Britain and beyond about how the Balfour Declaration of November 1917 and the 30 year British mandate over Palestine have rippled through more than a century of history, leaving in its wake a maelstream of tragedy, sorrow, and human suffering on all sides, with by far the greatest cost being borne by the Palestinians. I have been asked to speak today about one of these fateful ripples of history, the strange afterlife of the British Defence Emergency Regulations 1945, and particularly the role that its legislative descendants have played and are playing today in Israel's entrenched repression of the Palestinians in the occupied territory. Many of you who are listening to this presentation will know that the Israeli Minister of Defense, Benny Gantz, designated six Palestinian human rights and humanitarian organizations as terrorist organizations in October 2021. Under Israel's counter-terrorism legislation, this designation, if it becomes permanent, will enable it to ban the Palestinian organizations, seize their assets, charge and even imprison their leadership and staff with terrorist offenses and shutter for good their indispensable advocacy. These organizations have been living under the sword of Damocles ever since. You may also know that there are many thousands of Palestinians who have been convicted of security and terrorism offenses and sentenced to long terms of imprisonment. They were charged and found guilty under an Israeli military court system that denies most of the fundamental features of a fair trial that are embedded in international law and familiar to us in the West, such as the right to an impartial judiciary, the right to know all of the evidence and the allegations against you, the right to be able to make full answer to these allegations, and the right to be tried in your own language. Thousands more Palestinians have been incarcerated throughout the five decades of the occupation through the mechanism of administrative detention. This permits Israel to arrest and detain a Palestinian as a security suspect for periods of six months at a time without charges, without evidence, without a trial and without a conviction. These six-month administrative detentions 
can be continuously renewed by the Israeli authorities through a perfunctory application to the Israeli military courts with no meaningful judicial oversight or review. All these military legal processes and procedures and more are anchored in Israel's counter-terrorism law of 2016, which has been heavily criticized by international human rights organizations and experts for its sweeping definitions, its denial of basic rights for defendants, and its promiscuous use by the Israeli military to shrink the available space for Palestinian civil society organizations to carry on their invaluable work in shining a spotlight on the many abuses of the 55 year old Israeli occupation. I will return to the counterterrorism law shortly. To understand the scale and sweep of Israel's counterterrorism law, we have to start with its legislative ancestor, the British Defense Emergency Regulations 1945. These regulations were promulgated by the British Mandate Authority in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, as the various underground organizations of the Jewish Yeshuv were scaling up their armed resistance to the British Mandate with the aim of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. The British Defence Emergency Regulations 1945 replaced an earlier body of repressive security laws and orders enacted in 1937 to counter the Great Arab Revolt <coughs> against the British Mandate. This 1936 to 39 revolt was triggered by the growing realization by the Palestinians that their quest for an independent state in Palestine was being thwarted by the collaboration between the mandate and the Zionist movement building towards a Jewish state in Palestine in accordance with the Balfour Declaration and its incorporation into the League of Nations mandate granted to Britain. The Palestinian claim to an independent state and mandate Palestine, consistent with the promise of self-determination contained in Woodrow Wilson's 14 Principles of 1919, its Class A mandate designation by the League of Nations, and most of all, by their indigenous status and overwhelming demographic presence in Palestine, was answered by the bayonets of the British military. These 1937 regulations gave the British High Commissioner in Palestine broad powers to repress the Arab revolt in the name of public security. In the words of the 1937 British Order in Council, the High Commissioner could use, the High Commissioner could use his unfettered discretion to suppress mutiny, rebellion and riot and for maintaining supplies and services essential to the life of the community. By the time the British defeated the revolt in 1939, more than 5,000 Palestinians had been killed, thousands more had been wounded, imprisoned or exiled, and the Palestinian leadership had been politically decimated. The use of the repressive tools in the 1937 Order in Council was decisive in quelling the three-year Palestinian uprising. Eight years later, in 1945, with the well-organized, well-trained and increasingly well-armed Jewish militias initiating their final bid to end the British mandate, to stifle the Palestinian claim for self-determination, and to establish a Jewish state in Palestine through force, the British modernized its 1937 Order in Council into the British Defense Emergency Regulations 1945. These regulations established military courts to try and convict anyone in Palestine thought to have committed security offenses. These courts consisted of three military officers, 
who could consider secret evidence that would not be disclosed to the defendant. Their decisions were not open to appeal. British military and police officers had the power to search any place, arrest any person, and detain them indefinitely on the basis of mere suspicion. Administrative detention was employed, as was the expulsion of any person from Palestine. While the violence between the Jewish militias and the British military in Palestine was fierce in the years between 1945 and 48, most historians of the period agree that the levels of repression meted out by the British military against these militias and the Jewish Yeshuv were nowhere close to the scale of brutality employed against the Arab revolt a decade earlier. While the British military had much the same repressive legal tools to permit them a relatively free hand in quelling the respective revolts in the 1930s and the 1940s, against whom were they employing the violence? In the 1930s, it was against a, colon a colonized people. And in the 1940s, it was against a largely European emigre population with important Western sources of support. This was an important factor in explaining the differences in the levels of violence employed by the British. In May 1948, the British gave up their mandate in Palestine. The Jewish Yeshuv declared the State of Israel and the mass expulsion of the Palestinians intensified. The British revoked the defense emergency regulations several days before the formal end of the mandate. But the new Israeli government insisted that the regulations had not been properly abrogated and the government incorporated much of the regulations into the new Israeli legal system. <clears throat> this new life given to the defense emergency regulations had two consequences. First, in the period between 1948 and 1966, they were primarily used by Israel to establish and maintain a regime of military rule over Palestinian Arabs who had remained in Israel after the 1948 Nakba. During this period, the roughly 160,000 Palestinians in Israel who had not been expelled in 1948 were subject to a pass system that severely restricted their freedom of movement, containments on their political and civil rights, and arbitrary arrest and imprisonment for actions that were considered seditious or com contrary to public safety and order. While Israel also used the defense emergency regulations against Israeli Jews, most notably against the Lehi underground terrorist organization, which had assassinated Count Bernadotte in September 1948, it was the Palestinian citizens of Israel who bore the disproportionate brunt of the repressive stick through this time period. And second, after the Israeli government lifted the application of the regulations against its Palestinian citizens in late 1966, they remained on the law books. Within six months, they were reapplied with full force by the Israeli military commander to the newly captured Palestinian and Arab territories in the immediate aftermath of the June 1967 war. Their legitimacy and applicability was subsequently reaffirmed by the Israeli Supreme Court. Most of the justifications for movement restrictions and curfews, censorship, arbitrary arrests and detentions, home demolitions, prohibitions on political activity and civil society advocacy, deportations, area closures, and much more during the first five decades of the occupation finds its legal rationale under Israeli law 
in the Defence Emergency Regulations 1945. These regulations and their abusive application to buttress an illegal occupation that has become indistinguishable for annexation and apartheid has been the source of consistent criticism by both Palestinian and Israeli human rights organizations and by international advocacy organizations disturbed by the enormous daylight between the regulations and the obligatory requirements of international human rights and humanitarian law. In 2016, the Israeli government overhauled the regulations and recreated them as the counter-terrorism law. As a comprehensive letter on the counter-terrorism law by 11 UN special rapporteurs and human rights experts issued earlier this month the Israeli government has noted, there has been in effect a permanent and continuous emergency in Israeli law for 74 years and for 55 years in the occupied Palestinian territory. The focus of this state of permanent emergency has been almost entirely directed at the Palestinians with all the attendant enforcement of a profoundly embedded relationship of domination and subjugation, which that entails. Drawing from this remarkable May 2022 20, letter from the UN human rights experts to the Israeli government, I would like to focus, <coughs> excuse me, on four features of the 2016 counter-terrorism law, which illustrate two fundamental issues the purpose of today's conference. First, the legal and political continuity between the British emergency suppression laws from 1937 and 1945 to the present. And second, the continuity in the abusive use of so-called public safety laws that have much less to do with public safety and much more with perpetuating unwanted alien rule over a rebellious indigenous population that wants nothing more than independence and an end to their subjugation. The first feature that I would draw from the May 2022 letter by the human rights experts is their penetrating critique of the, of the counter-terrorism law as it is applied to so-called terrorist organizations in the occupied Palestinian territory. The letter forthrightly states that, the present legal and regulatory framework for designating terrorist organizations lacks precision in key respects, infringes on important rights, and may not meet the required thresholds of legality, necessity, proportionality, and non-discrimination under international law. The UN experts go on to say that they are concerned that the law might result in the unlawful infringement of the fundamental rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and association and freedom of opinion and expression, as well as fair trial rights and cause social, economic and cultural rights. I would point out that this May 2022 letter is the fifth occasion over the past 18 months that a number of UN human rights experts have issued public statements to both the Israeli government and the European Union, protesting against the thin body of publicly available evidence relied upon by the Israeli government under the law to justify its designation of the six Palestinian organizations as terrorist organizations and to persuade their international founders to starve the organizations of financial support. The second significant feature of the counter-terrorism law commented upon by the human rights experts is its reliance upon confidential information to secure designations and convictions. This 
is an anathema to modern democratic and human rights standards, and it follows a direct line from the British laws from 1937 and 1945. The definition of confidential information in the counter-terrorism law is any information where its disclosure is liable to harm state security, foreign relations, or public safety or security, or to reveal confidential work methods. The definition of what constitutes confidential information is determined by an advisory committee made up of judges and jurists expert in security law. This is what is known in that wonderful British political phrase, a safe pair of hands, who are committed to the worldview of us and them in the Israeli context. The third significant feature of the counterterrorism law, which draws a straight line from the past, is the utter lack of fair trial and due process rights. The UN experts noted the ubiquitous use of secret and confidential information that is substantially withheld from the defendants and their lawyers. Under international human rights law, the minimum guarantees protected include the presumption of innocence, the right to equality under the law, including the right to be informed promptly and in detail in a language which a defendant understands of the nature and cause of the charge as established by law against him, a speedy progress to trial, the right to a fair and public hearing by a competent, independent and impartial tribunal, and the right to judicial review and appeal. None of this is present in the current law, nor, as we have seen, were any of these rights present in any of the predecessor laws going back 85 years. The UN experts point out that these provisions come at the high cost of leaving organizations or individuals wholly unaware of the measures again taken against them, and in turn, their legal representatives unable to contest the designation. Equally disturbing, the expert stated, is the fact that it is the Israeli Minister of Defense, the same person who requests the designation in the first place, that makes the final decision on a permanent designation, albeit with the opportunity for judicial review in front of the Israeli Supreme Court. In my view, that should not provide comfort to those deeply worried about the protection of human rights and civil liberties in the OPT. The Israeli Supreme Court has proven itself to be a judicial handmaiden of the occupation, particularly given its most recent ruling earlier this month, endorsing the removal of Palestinian villages in the South Hebron Hills and its declaration in this decision that international law plays no role whatsoever in the administration of Israel's five decade long occupation. The fourth and final significant feature of the counterterrorism law that draws a straight line from the past is the severity and of the sanctions and penalties imposed upon defendants who have been convicted under the law. It provides for a wide range of criminal sanctions and penalties for designated individuals and organizations convicted under its provisions. Someone who is identified with a designated terrorist organization can be sentenced to a term of two to five years incarceration. Members or directors of a designated organization can re receive five to 25 years of imprisonment. And someone who supports or incites in favor of a hostile organization can receive a sentence of 10 years. 
virtually none of the definitions, designations, or penalties in the counterterrorism law and its associated orders satisfy the minimum standards of international law. One would wish that such an argument would catch the attention of Israeli lawmakers, Israeli judges, and the Israeli military officers who enact, interpret, and apply these sweeping provisions. One would hope that the eyes of the international community, particularly European and North American states who proclaim that they are deeply invested in supervision of the occupation and realizing their vision of a two-state solution, would focus on this deeply illiberal legal regime and call for its abolition on the road to swiftly ending this forever occupation. In conclusion, may I say that the constant historical thread of these repressive laws from 1937 and 1945 to this very day is the perpetuation of an unwanted and deeply resented alien rule over a people and a country that have become in many ways the political orphans of the modern system of international relations. The partition of Palestine was the first major decision of the young United Nations in 1947 and arguably its first major blunder. <coughs> After all, the UN of 1947 is not reflective of the UN of today, and it is almost impossible to imagine that it would endorse today the severing of a country against the profound wishes of its indigenous and majority population. But the UN of today remains haunted by that decision. As Kofi Annan said in his 2012 memoirs, the unresolved question of Palestine has stained the reputation and the efficacy of the organization. There is no conflict in the modern world where the UN and the international community have spoken with such consistency and in such volume about the rules of international law which apply to the obligations of Israel, the occupying power, and to the rights that are to be claimed by the Palestinian people. Yet, yet where the international community has acted with such remarkable political passivity in enforcing its own rules-based legal order. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for reading um, such an interesting um, exposition uh, by Michael Link. And it certainly does demonstrate the way in which the sins of the mandate carry on into today's world as at least a, a model, uh, a very bad model for um, the way um, that um, law should be exercised.